to rethink our production scale and you know what it means to produce even though we're using sustainable fabrics but um, if you're producing at large with large quantities uh, I feel like it's not sustainable anymore and I think now with the new generation um, it is it's, it's more an holistic a holistic view it's 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 in all levels of society it's not only about sustainable it's not only about um, uh, quantity it's also about quality quality of life you understand uh, every impact that you can make and of course on your consumer consumer behavior the people you're following on social media so also when you're giving your like on Instagram you're also uh, endorsing and so uh, and we need to realize we're all part of that same ecosystem so with everything we design we use in our daily life we need to understand that it's it, it you cannot just let it disappear Just when fair and sustainable industries start to gain more awareness, the COVID-19 pandemic has been the common enemy for the world economy. In a way, people's awareness on the importance of taking good care of the earth seems to be increasing, especially with staying at home means an easier lifestyle to be combined with minimalism. But what will it mean for the long term? especially with the movement amidst the creative industry itself towards fair and sustainable industry. And after all, is sustainability only about un environmental issues or there is a lot much spectrum to understand? Today, I, Subhan J. Hakim, Managing Editor for Dewey Magazine and also Chief Content Officer for Jakarta Fashion Week. Joining with me here is Yolanda Melser, Head of Culture and Communication and Netherlands Embassy to Indonesia. We also have Agus Sastro, the designer from the brand Wastu Studio from Jakarta. The last but not least, we have Ista Bozard, co-founder of Textile Lab, and also Beatrice Sandini, concept developer for Textile Lab. Hi, everyone. How are you today? I'm well, fine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to 4 p.m. talk. Um, so how is staying at home situation so far for you all? Maybe we could start with Yolanda. Yeah, I think we're getting used to uh, the home working from home situation. We have a team of 14 people working from home. But on the other hand, we are, as Erasmus House, we are closed since half uh, March. And um, we have no artists coming over, no ex exhibitions, no shows. And, well, that's, that's, that's hard, I think. And um, so working from home is, is felt like a temporary uh, uh, period. And uh, we are very eager to uh, to work to to work together again. Though there, I think there is there are some changes in our thinking about how we will deal with with our Erasmus House or with our work in the future. Okay. How about you, Ista and Bea? Well, I think we we are a creative research lab, which means we really have a physical lab with a lot of machinery. Um, people working there. So that is really difficult to do the really the hands-on research. Uh, so we need to find really ways of very strong time slots that one person, two people at the same time can, uh, can work here. Um, and I think we kind of manage, but just to have the, the, the brainstorms and really this, uh, this, this creative environment to do your work, that is sometimes uh, I think what you really miss uh, from home. <laughs> okay. And Albus, how is it? How is it going? Well, I always work from home, so it's not much of a change, except for, you know, now we meet less people and um, all the meetings are done with all these Zoom and, you know, WhatsApp calls, which I do like because we save so much time in Jakarta, you know, <laughs> without the traffic and um, all the waiting. It's, it's, um, it's very effective, actually. Okay. Okay. That's okay. what I. That's what I meant with with we <laughs> are going to make some changes because being in the traffic for an hour to meet each other for an hour and then being back in the traffic that I think we can do a lot on Zoom and MS Teams but personal personal contact is really important I think if we yeah. uh, if we want to be creative especially. I yes. agree. I really agree about that. Okay, but, uh, I would like to start with the first discussion. Um, I would like to ask to August, Ista and Bea, when we talk about the pandemic, of course, uh, it has impacted all of us and not only about economic, but also socially. 
what happened behind the scenes at um, each of your institution? Maybe we could start with August. Um, we've had to rethink our production scale and you know, what it means to produce, even though we're using sustainable fabrics, but um, if you're producing at large quant with large quantities, uh, I feel like it's not sustainable anymore. And this is becoming a problem, I think, for me personally, because um, now with this whole situation, we have so much back stock and it's, mm. uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be a financial issue, I think. Okay. How about you, uh, Ista and Bea? Yeah, I think Ista already mentioned a bit in the beginning that for us it was really hard, uh, of course, not to have the human touch, but then especially even more uh, not being able to use physically the space. We had for almost three months that the, that the lab was fully closed and then now we are back, but we are facing a second wave. So again, we, we have a lot of restriction. And then shifting from this physical space into everything online. For certain projects, it works, and for others, it doesn't. So it's a big uh, year of adaptations and, uh, and facing for each different uh, project that we work with, we can adapt in a certain way. And certain just had to be postponed because we really needed to be physically present on the same place. So uh, how is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, talking about sustainability, I do believe the sustainable sustainability issue is not only about environmental issue. There is a wider spectrum about this, from ethical working conditions for workers, uh, circular economy, recycling or repurposing materials to developing biomaterials, and I believe everyone could take part. Do you agree with this? On and on which spectrum are you working with the issue? I would like to ask to uh, Ista and Bea first. Yeah, first of all, I fully agree. Um, so often there is this very limited understanding of sustainability, but I think within the textile lab and then the projects we work on, we really look at the full spectrum and also how they all relate to, to each other. Because um, of course it's such a huge industry. So we really look at materials, processes, tools, techniques, culture, uh, systems. So the moment you also develop a material, let's say, it has impact on the way it's made, it's used. Um, so it's like we have different entry points to really keep also questioning what we actually um, uh, research and uh, what we see as a possible alternative. Okay. And how about you, August? Well, when we started, um, uh, when we launched this brand, we partnered with a... Uh, an industry giant in Indonesia called Pan Others, and they produced uh, so much uh, imported uh, software that we decided we were only going to use waste if we were to produce a uh, close with them. But um, now I think the next step is to uh, educate the consumer because we have, uh, I think the problem with fast fashion now is the consumer mindset. Everyone feels like they need to keep buying clothes and nobody knows, I think, especially in our generation now, nobody knows how to take care of clothes, nobody mends clothes anymore. And uh, people are, uh, you know, they want an Instagram presence. So they always want to wear something new for their photo feeds. And that's really not necessary because I've, you know, you know, even the Queen of Denmark recycles her clothes. So why should normal people like us wear something new every day? It's ridiculous. If I can add to that, I think we fully agree. It's also understanding actually the value of, of clothes and, and the making and to understand what the real price actually actually is. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot about understanding a different behavior, uh, revaluing. Okay. Great. Yeah, I guess uh, we have really uh, two different approach here from August as maybe to uh, more clothes that uh, clothes that could be wear like 10 to 20 years and maybe Ista and Bea is more about uh, understanding full spectrum of the sustainability issue on this point. I would like to go to Yolanda. Uh, Yolanda, I do believe the sustainability issue in the Netherlands is already level up to more, to more advanced discussion. Could you share a bit about the ongoing discussion that happened there right now? Yeah, what you mentioned in the first place, of course, it's lasting for uh, at least 20 to 30 years already discussion with mostly 
environmental uh, uh, discussion. And I think now with the new generation, um, it is it's it's more an holistic a holistic view. It's 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 in all levels of society. It's not only about sustainable. It's not only about um, uh, quantity. It's also about quality quality of life. It's about um, uh, poor and rich people and and bridge the gap between that it's it's about electric cars about no plastic use of plastic bags in uh, so it's getting i think the pandemic also helped this in a way to be more aware of how we build our future and how we want to build our world and uh, yes the the, um, um, the netherlands um, government decided to focus on this because it's it's also about building sustainable relationship be between people and we see that uh, for example, the development of internet div uh, di divides people into groups uh, being in their own bubble much more, much, much broader than, than only the environmental part of it. Yeah. No, sorry, just if I can add to that, because uh, as Jolan is saying, there's also this kind of uh, the split, let's say, of, of groups so that the one hand, mm -hmm. there's such a urge and such a question coming from companies, uh, the students, citizens that or consumers that want something different. And also if we, we look at the, 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 the goals of the government to really move towards circular economy. And at the same time, you see also during this pandemic that the first people they fire in the, in the bigger fashion uh, companies is actually people working on the sustainability department. So there's really this strange friction, but it definitely shows the urgency of rethinking this system and this industry. I agree with you. There's, it's, there's, this is quite ironic, right? And um, I guess in Indonesia, sustainability is sometimes misguided as only environmental issue and even worse, it sometimes become a very sexy promotional campaign for marketing to increase awareness about this issue, what kind of program that Erasmus has uh, could offer and on which spectrum Indonesians should understand towards sustainability issues. I would like to ask to Yolanda. Yeah, of course, if we if we put sustainability on the agenda uh, as the Netherlands, we also have to put, we put it on the agenda at the Erasmus House, of course. So the, we took the decision that in, if we involve in project, we always look at this part. What what sustainable part does it have on people, on, on environment, on mentality, on everything? So it's a way to to work on this uh, um, mentality change that is so needed to uh, to, to build a better world. Um, so, for example, it, it's, it's in smaller and bigger things. But we have, for example, these these sustainable cups. Uh, um, we work with with um, musicians and, and not for one time uh, uh, asking them to come over to perform, but to, to build on a relationship. We are thinking over um, bringing people in. How uh, or can we do it online? Because we proved last last month that there's a lot of, of possibilities online as well. Um, so we are rethinking uh, um, our program in the Erasmus House and our future in Erasmus House as well. And I see everybody around doing this. So it is, I think that's the good part. It's of course the bad part that's still about um, earning a lot of money or the marketing part of it or the business, the, 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 um, uh, um, yeah, the producing and, and consuming is still about earning a lot of money. I think we have to switch this towards another another point of, of looking at the world. And yeah. Okay. I would like to I would like to ask to everyone, um, this pandemic has already changed the world and did you think this is the right momentum to work, to rethink about fashion industry in general and do you think this is also a catalyst to speed up change on the industry right now? My first reaction is yes, because it also shows how vulnerable such a like global organized industry is. So to be able to to adapt to to change or to sudden um, uh, events, let's say, it's very important to be structured and organized differently. Uh, and also look much more on the, let's say, local economy, local products. Um, so I think let's say it really shows the urgency and i hope that is also understood by let's say the, the the bigger companies but i think from the level we work on and also with the citizens the designers uh the the, the smes i think it's uh, it's very clear
Yeah, and uh, especially when you mentioned about this greenwashing uh, marketing strategy, and I think what if fashion still sees sustainability as a trend, like uh, a color that it's in season, it's going to keep still being a marketing tool. But uh, the more the governments and society and citizens, consumers uh, get aware of it, and understand that this is a choice on how to move with the industry towards the future is no longer a trend. This needs to be from the creative to logistics to embedded in every single part of uh, a certain brand or a certain uh, company. And then I think research institutes like ours propose this change in many different uh, fronts. So from researching a new biomaterial, but also on how to act uh, to make a systematic change in that sense. And that's uh, a slow process, but that needs to happen in parallel in multiple players, I guess. Yeah, and to really move indeed away from the, the concept and to have sustainability as a topic of your story, but really also incorporate it in your, your uh, business model, uh, the way you use it, the way it's made. So, yeah. Okay, slow but sure, but it is strictly done right. Okay, um, the same question goes to Argos. What do you think about this one? Well, I think it's a time to be more critical and to question things, which is um, not, you know, part of the culture in Indonesia. People don't question things. You, know? you need to want to know where your fabric comes from. You need to be um, a bit more curious. And this is the only way that uh, we can sort of promote sustainability. Because if nobody wants to, um, if people are not, you know, interested in finding out, then there is, you know, sustainability really is an abstract concept. It's like, you know, organic food in Indonesia. Everybody thinks organic is sexy, but nobody really understands what it means. Yeah. Okay. But it also really asks for transparency and, and, and for people to, to be able to understand these things that you're mentioning. Yeah. yeah, for sure. How about you, Yolanda? I think um, it, it also, when you have no food, <laughs> it's hard to question where the food comes from or if you have, if, if, if you have, it's, it's all about having the choice to do so. And I think in, a, um, uh, in developed countries, it, you are obliged to ask these questions. So I agree with August, but there's also, it's, I think it's hard to judge people who do, because you don't know the situation, but I know that for, for sure that the, um, in the Netherlands where people can ask this, uh, uh, these questions, where does my, where the, uh, is my food or my, are my clothes coming from? Um, how do I, do I take my bike or do I go by, by car? Uh, um, so you, sh you are, yeah, you're really obliged to do so. So it's not, it's not questioning anymore. It's, it's, it's an obligation, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I, I fully agree, but sometimes it's, um, I know a lot of, um, let's say, consumers, citizens, people, we all wear clothes. So um, they really want to, to make different choices, but sometimes it's so difficult to understand what is a better choice if something is produced in a fair way. Maybe toxic, like uh, very toxic um, uh, chemicals are used for the dyeing process, or maybe it has been transported three times around the globe. So it, it's really complex to, to understand this. And at the same time, so often in, in, in the culture, we are approached as consumers, so not as people or citizens. So we are really trained to, to consume, let's say. So that's also really a culture uh, shift. And uh, I think I know a lot of people that kind of were a bit like, yeah, I, I gave up. Uh, I tried to do good. And again, it turns out there is a scandal. So that's also very complex. Or that at least feel better if there is one tag in their garment when they're in the shop saying organic cotton. Oh, good. I'm helping something. And it can be organic cotton dyed in bad ways, sued in Bangladesh, shipped back to, to Europe. And, and yeah, way too what, much what water does that used. mean? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, a lot of a lot of things maybe people didn't really know right now. Um, maybe maybe start to questioning every bit of it. Maybe it's gonna help to understand the the full spectrum of it. Okay, I would like to go to the uh, the next discussion. Um, sustainable fashion has always been somehow distant, and 
it's being made for only certain class of people, mainly because uh, the more sustainable, maybe it would be less affordable. Of course, different treatments in its manufacture and fair pricing back with fair working wage are a big part of it. Even before the pandemic, only a few businessmen can maintain their existence. Has it become an extra burden in the middle of this pandemic to perceive sustainability as luxury? I would like to ask to Ista and Bea. Yeah, I think the question should be why so cheap? Uh, and why can you buy fashion so cheap? And uh, if you look at the industry and the average price of, uh, of single garments, it is one of the only industries where this buy price has been decreasing significantly over the years and uh, who is paying for that cost and then this is often I think uh, where the discussion this discussion should go when you're talking about expensive uh, or luxury sustainability and also back to what I said about how do we perceive sustainability if it's it can cannot be a premium tag on your garment it should be uh, yeah just uh, presumptions of how you should should run the, the business and then you start having this this change of mindset and if everyone i think there is a problem of volume of course if you're doing a certain specific yeah, dying to your garment that you only have three people in the world doing that that's going to have a price but if you incentivize that in, in order to become a, a norm within a, a certain process then also of course, you're going to get uh, better costs in it, but it's really, I think, looking at the other side rather than, um, yeah. And also, again, about value, because I'm sometimes amazed that I'm just really talking for, for the Netherlands, um, how people, how much people can spend on a new phone mm -hmm. or when they go to, to a festival or event, and then they find fashion that is more, let's say, ethical or sustainable, they, they just don't want to uh, invest in that. So I think there's also a really strange idea that fashion is cheap. Yeah. Uh, I would like to August, the, uh, I would like to ask August about the same questions. Well, I, I always question, you know, what is affordable? And I mean, what is what is an appropriate price tag? I. I mean, I grew up with the concept that, you know, you need to buy something and you invest in it, like Ishta said, you know, it's like, uh, it's, everything is an investment. I mean, you, of course you make mistakes every now and then, but at least you have the mindset, you know, and you sort of uh, assess your necessities, you know, do I really need this? Can I wear this, you know, more than, you know, 10 times? Am I still going to like it in a year? And, you know, those, those things are, I think, important. When, when buying clothes and uh, and I do and I don't think uh, sustainability is a luxury it's not so I mean a luxury is something that is not necessary whereas sustainability is I think everyone's concern so it's not a luxury it's it's a must I think it's one of the things that should be um, uh, involved in the education uh, program of children to just to uh, just like you said ask, asking questions is is one of the the the, the base um, things uh, children should should learn in uh, in their in their schools to where where does where are things coming from how does the world um, um, uh, acts on, 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 on food and on fashion and on, on everything you buy. And why do I buy things? Can I borrow things? Can I, it's, it's learning about this. I think it should be, should, should be done as, as soon as possible, as soon as a child is. is uh, that's, I think, uh, one of the different things between Indonesia and the Netherlands, for example, is that um, I, I know for sure, I don't know at the moment, but I know in the Netherlands, people, children of two or three years are, are, uh, old are asked, what do you want to wear today? So do you want your red trousers or do you want your blue trousers? Do you want a white t-shirt or do you want a blue t-shirt? And so it's, it's all about being, to discuss things and to, 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 and if, if the child says, no, I don't want the blue one, I want the white one, oh, would it, why, do, why do you want the blue one? Right? So it's, it, it's asking questions starts very soon. So I, it should be taken over in the school to make a program to be, to be, to be consumer active um, 
um, people and to just about learning about fake news or how do I get the real information. Uh, for example, in the Netherlands, it's obliged to put on the labels if you buy food what what ingredients are in this. So it should and also put in the in the fashion labels that comes from Indonesia or comes from India or and if it's organic. And then again, of course, you have to question this because it it sometimes this, it it is it is faked and it is uh, because it's trendy. So. But at, in the end, we we are all in this together. So let's be honest. Let's be transparent and and let's discuss and let's ask questions. And I think step by step we are getting there. I'm very optimistic. Maybe not yeah. in my life, but <laughs> the next generation. But I really like that you're saying also that we're in it together because also we're working on a project about making cities circular. So there are different cities in Europe that focus on different materials and Amsterdam focuses on textiles. And of course, that does not happen overnight. So it's really yeah. a project in a long-term plan towards really circular economy uh, in, in 2030 and 2050. Uh, but then we can also say, okay, this is what we have. This is the first step. This we don't know. That we do know. So also being honest about that whole transition process. I should admit this one. Um, in Indonesia, people still perceiving fashion is something that uh, cheap. The clothes is much cheap. If, if it is not cheaper, is people not gonna buy it? Some uh, it is still happen in Indonesia. And um, do you think? Uh, I would like to ask. I would. I would like to ask to August. Do you think this is also a burden for us? Uh, for Indonesian to understand about the sustainability issue? Well, I think this, uh, you know, perceiving clothes as cheap is not just in Indonesia. I think it's uh, in many different places. I lived in the United States. People treated fashion that way as well. I think we're following a very unsustainable American model here. And... Um, and I think it's time to change, but it's not, it's not something that can happen overnight because I think it's part of the developing mentality, you know, to, to yes. sort of out with the old and in with the new. You yes. see it in many different countries. It's not exclusive to us, I don't think. And this was a construction that happened uh, throughout many, many years that, that fashion became so cheap and so desirable and so disposable. So it's also, it takes many, many years to disconstruct that. And I think it's from the past 10 years that the, the sustainability in fashion itself finally got track and uh, traction. And as you said, it started really as an environmental issue. So really looking on the ecology side of it. And now it's going uh, through the, the whole spectrum. So, but yeah, we are coming from the Coca-Cola generation and McDonald's <laughs> and, the, and that went into fashion very quickly, but it's, it's a long time uh, all the way to, to go on the other side now. Okay. Of course, it will be this transformation will cost a lot of pain, I think, because uh, coming from having huge productions and huge stock towards, okay, we make what we use and we reuse, uh, in, in between there will, be, there will be falling down a lot of um, shops, uh, producers, industry, half an industry, I think. So we have to rethink how to, how to yeah, um, how to reconstruct the whole um, the whole situation, and that's and also, step. It comes also a lot with looking at ourselves and our own ego. I mean, the fashion industry is very much ego driven. You have this star designer, you have this moment of fame. Uh, hardly anyone is credited. So also in that sense, we need to be be humble and facilitate this process. And I think also our standing of what innovation actually is and what development means as you are kind of referring to already August. And I mean, in, in the Netherlands to, 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 to have this consumer approach, I think we can learn so much also from other countries. And I think in that sense, we, we need to let go in some parts really of our standing of who is in front in this transition. I, I think it doesn't work like that. I mean, every country and every culture and every subculture, they have their own knowledge that we really need to, to learn from. I mean, I think in the Netherlands, we are really not taking care of our heritage and the techniques that we have, or in, in some more, I think, uh, parts of, uh, of Europe, maybe even worldwide. I think it's really different per country. So that is something we can really learn from. 
Okay. I would like to back to uh, with Yolande. You have so many programs um, around this topic. I mean, uh, sustainability issues and but how Indonesian audience some uh, right now receive it. Has it going really well for you? Well, of course, in reaching out, you see that it's a certain group of people who is interested in these kind of things. And it, in, in Indonesia, there's a growing middle class um, group. And um, well, it, as Erasmus has, we have, we have uh, 25,000 followers, for example. So we are in discussion with them and they come to our performances and exhibitions. And um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, being uh, aware of the fact that within the discussion and within reaching out to each other, um, we, we solve the problem together. And to I, I like what Issa said about being open and and be aware that we have some experience, but people in Indonesia have also the experience. And to 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 combine this and see what we can do together in uh, in this. Um, so it, it is an issue to, that should be talked about and to, to find solutions and um, to share experiences. I think that's, that's important. And in the end, for all human beings, and in general, I think for human beings, it's just very hard to, to change. <laughs> yeah, we should adapt to change, right? <laughs> okay. I've seen some programs from Ista and Bea. Uh, one of your programs is really stood out, stood out for me. Uh, it is the Bio Shades. Could you tell us about the program? Yeah, so BioShade started around five years ago and it's a research um, track, let's say, um, that really focuses on alternatives for the, 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 the chemical and harmful processes um, that are used, of course, for dyeing and also the, the, the dyes themselves. So, um, yeah, I, I like to share the, the story. My, the, the other, let's say, partner in crime co-founder, Cecilia Raspanti, one day walked into the lab with another colleague, Nina, and the, we have a, a lab for biology mm -hmm. and biodesign and bio art. And it was an artist working with bacteria that produce pigments. So they were making, or she was making watercolors. So suddenly Cecilia was like, oh, what happens if we put this on textiles? So they just started experimenting and it turned out that it's actually light fast, wash fast. So it kind of fits the industry standards. Mm -hmm. um, so that became a research uh, project. I can also show you a little, but of course you cannot tell the bacteria they will grow on the fabric, but of course you cannot tell them go left or go right. So this is kind of the patterns they can produce. Nice. And this became a whole research project, but to also question, um, is it scalable? But is that actually what we want? Can we work in more distributed manner? So at this point, it's really a worldwide um, a research project and so many people tapped into it. We found out that other people were working on this um, already as well. So it's chemists, engineers, uh, designers, all really working uh, together on this research and to and yeah, I think it, it's really questioning where does the colors come from? And uh, this is also the whole wave of uh, natural dye gaining uh, a lot of uh, new adapts and, and people experimenting. And then imagining the bacteria as one of uh, yeah, the existing life forms that are all over us was here way before us. And they are also producing color and, and pigments and that we can also use that as a partnership or creation. And uh, by just allowing the bacteria to grow together with the fabric is when it produces the pigment and that you that uh, gets embedded in the in the fibers. But it's it's really a new way of thinking of it, because when you you look in the shop at that certain thing, it's blue, pink, yellow. You just, you, you don't realize uh, what does it mean for them to be those colors because we're just now in the concept that everything is chemical. You just put a formula somewhere and it's going to print you that color. And this is not the history of color and uh, or a history of dyes and pigments. And it's, it's nice to, to understand that this can come from so many different sources in nature and uh, even sources that you would... Uh, tend to avoid like the bacteria for instance and these are of course um, 
non-harmful bacteria. They are all uh, friendly <laughs> bacteria, but still, you need, uh, yeah, to 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 grow them in a. I'm just wondering, place. maybe in the future, maybe we could we could see that the material being um, being used uh, everywhere. I mean, like this is this is maybe something that's quite futuristic for me to see the uh, bacteria develop uh, some uh, some pattern and some color that maybe it's not. It's not. Uh, it's not always the same. Maybe it's always a different patterns, right? Exactly. Also, and and that's actually the 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 nice thing that it also questions why do we think in these strict formulas? I mean, yellow is yellow, and it always needs to stay yellow even after ten years if you still have it. Uh, but why is not the fading of the colors maybe really beautiful? It can make it unique. And also, since we work with a lot of other people in other countries. Everybody in this process deals with other problems. I mean, different temperature, different humidity, different uh, resources that you have around you. So that makes it also interesting to see, okay, we are globally connected and we share all the information, but locally we have our own way of working uh, and also own way of producing and doing the research. Okay, okay. Um, I would like to ask to August, um, textiles are also an integral part on Indonesian culture. Um, and if we look to our tradition, most of it is a slow fashion product uh, that could be passed on by generations. What kind of learning that Indonesian should take on that? Oh, well, I come from a family of batik makers, but they stopped making batik in the 1940s because, I mean, it was it fell out of trend, you know, with the with the influx of Western clothing. People didn't wear, you know, not as many people wore uh, the the sarong anymore for you know for um for formal occasions people you know the public was more interested in conforming to uh, imported clothing so this sort of wiped, wiped out that industry at large i mean the uh, traditional cloth is very sustainable because you can pass it on because it's size free and um most of it has been you know it's it's very slow fashion a good batik takes over a year to make, actually, and it con and I remember my uh, my grandmother discussing the price of two pieces of batik cloth can be uh, exchanged for a car in the in the thirties or forties. So it it cost a lot, you know, and um, that really fell out of fashion. But uh, if you if we look at you know places like India where people still wear the sari, it's because I think. Um, they're very proud of their cultural heritage, and Indonesia, I think, needs to learn how to, uh, you know about being more proud. We need to be more proud of our cultural heritage, because we, we've gone through so many periods of colonization. You know, in, even in the in the late twentieth century, you know, we had no offense to the Dutch. I mean, after the Dutch left, and then we had the Japanese, and then we had you know the the um, the american colonization and you know arabization and the chinese sort of invasion and we've we've had everything and that's why we're very confused about who we are now but i think we really need to dig deep into you know our cultural roots and go back to traditional wear if possible you know modernized of course so that's yeah. that's also a reason why uh, maybe you all always uh, try to de develop a silhouette that maybe re representing Indonesian clothing, Indonesian tradition, uh, some somehow Indonesian silhouette, or maybe Indonesian how Indonesian uh, do their clothing somehow. Well, we try as best as we can, but you know we also have to understand that Indonesian clothing were, came from somewhere else. That's what Indonesia is. It's a, it was always a melting pot and a trading post. Everything originated from somewhere else. But um, a lot of Indonesians are very culture proud in that way. And they don't want to admit that something was um, influenced from a different culture. They want to, they want it, uh, they want to think it's original. Yeah. Is that in there? Maybe you want to add something? No, I, I just... When you say that, that, that being proud of your heritage, it, it also, um, we have an artist in resident at the moment, Teresa van Twijver, and she really looks into uh, traditional clothes, Dutch clothing, and it's so interesting, the things she, she finds really from the techniques, the materials, but also how they really became pieces that you hand over from generation to generation. And now 
indeed extremely sustainable it is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I, I just to say that I <laughs> fully agree. And yeah. Yeah, I yeah, want, and to, want to add something as well. Don't, oh, I ask a question to August. Don't you think that at the moment um, Indonesia is uh, uh, rediscovering its heritage in this way? I have the feeling that uh, there's a lot of interest from um, Western countries for, for Batik or the, 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 uh, the historic um, uh, skills and, and methods. Don't you think that it's it would be a, a good opportunity to, to take this old heritage skills and techniques to reboost it. And I think there will be a lot of um, interest in this. Well, I hope so. Um, but I think we need a lot of help in that department, especially from maybe the Dutch government. A lot of our batiks are in the Tropen Museum, like my great grandmother's creations. Um, you know, there needs to be some sort of a, perhaps exchange to bring them here sometime, but also to teach the museums here how to preserve them because we don't have a good uh, system or a good funding for the museums here. Well, can, I can uh, um, tell you something about this. Because the Netherlands to, uh, to advise on colonial uh, objects and collections being in the Dutch Museum. So we were, they also talked with uh, Kim Dickboot to, uh, to um, how to, how uh, the Netherlands and Indonesia can work together in, in bringing back uh, the objects or textiles maybe that should be here and also with a, a, com with a research project and, and um, um, with trainings on museology and things like that. So we're working on this and hopefully this will uh, turn out uh, right. Yeah. Fantastic. We will great to, to hear that from you more. Uh, I mean, that's a really, really great opportunity to start with to, yeah. between the countries. Okay, um, the last question for this discussion, um, what could we expect from sustainability movement around the globe in the future? Um, what is the most important matter to start with, with right now, right here, right now? I would like to ask with Yolanda. Well, I think I already said, I think education is, is basic in this. To teach our children how to treasure the world, how to deal with each other, with other people, with, with uh, things they should be proud of, of their own heritage. Well, it all starts with, with education and, and to, to treasure what, what, um, what we have and what our, what our history was, is and what our future should be. Okay. Is time there? Maybe you could you could ask uh, you could answer the question also. Yeah. <laughs> <Who starts? laughs> yeah. The, the, like I, I don't think there can be one specific topic to start with, but uh, yeah, as Yolanda say, I think it's education, but also as a citizen, citizen to understand uh, every impact that you can make, and of course on your consumer consumer behavior but also on your political choices, on who, who you're putting into power, uh, the companies you're going to get uh, closer to, the people you're following on social media. So also when you're giving your like on Instagram, you're also uh, endorsing a certain speech. So is this person uh, aligned with your values or you just like their looks? And I think every single action uh, needs to move forward towards this envision of, of a sustainable uh, future as well. And um, yeah, but I, one specific item, I think we mentioned many, many different paths. I think it's very hard to choose because uh, yeah, for me, it's really a ecosystem of uh, all things that need to happen in parallel and together. Yeah, and for me, it's also important because often we have the discussion also in projects um, like where we need to convince the big players. And I, I think more and more, we really just need to connect with the people that are actually doing it worldwide with our local communities. Um, so really go where the, where the energy is. And then at some point, the others need to transform and, and, and follow. I think then in that sense, we can really uh, set up very sustainable uh, networks um, and really that to foster collaboration as well and I wanted to say something else and I it slipped my mind <laughs> I, I leave it uh, yeah that, that that is something that I find so strange I just remember as a, as a child and also going to, uh, to when I was studying 
we were never really taught the, the, the content, let's say, or explained like we are part of one ecosystem. And the models that were shown to us were so linear. And if you put something in the trash, where does it go to? And just to understand that we, we have an urgency that we really share. Uh, and we need to realize we're all part of that same ecosystem. So with everything we design, we use in our daily life, we need to understand that it's, it, it, you cannot just let it disappear, the fabrics or, or the dyes or the whatever you, you use. So yeah, I think that realization and the questioning. Yeah, I, yeah, I, totally, you I totally agree with that. Yeah, August, you want to add something? Well, I think, you know, I, Ever since the pandemic happened, nobody realized how uh, quickly interconnected we are. You know, every, you think, oh, it's just happening there. It's not going to reach us. But, you know, wait, wait uh, in two weeks, it, it's here. You know, and um, no one realized how uh, connected we are. And uh, I just think we just need more empathy at the moment, you know, when, because to realize what, whatever we do has a... We, we reap what we sow, basically. And um, you throw something here, it might end up in the other side of the world. So, you know, somebody else throwing something else might end up in your uh, beach. So just, you know, I guess you have to be more empathetic in life. So. And of course, we, I want to add that we, we need role models in this. Um, I think you were talking about the, the Danish queen uh, wearing. So our queen was wearing the same dress in a different color. She, she recolored it. And so, and it was mentioned several times in, in the newspapers. And I think that's very important because um, a lot of people buy things in vintage stores or are, uh, and a lot of people don't, of course. So we, uh, if, if role models are, are giving the good examples, that will help. So maybe, um, and, and what I like about Indonesia is that in official, in official meetings, everybody is wearing batik. Uh, uh, Jokowi is ba wearing batik all the time. That, that is really important to, to, um, to emphasize the, the, the proud of a country. And yeah, I think that helps as well. Okay. Okay. I do believe uh, everyone is really connected and... Um, everything that we throw away, maybe it's some, somehow it end up uh, to another people. And yes, this pandemic is, I, I guess, um, we, we need better understanding to how, how we connected each other and we need to empathize uh, on everything that we have right now. Okay, um, I guess this is the end of this discussion. Thank you everyone for sharing your insight for us. And if you want to know more insight from Erasmus House, uh, please visit netherlandsandu.nl and also get to know more about was 2 at www.shopwas2.com and Ista Bosart uh, and Bea at wach.org uh, and also uh, Textile Lab. If you want to know more about the magazine and Jakarta Fashion Week, you can visit us on our social media website and application as shown below. Stay safe and see you on our next 4 p.m. talk episodes. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.